So I want to pray corporately. If you were here for prayer meeting this morning, you know that we prayed for these things, but I want to pray together. Some of you know, some of you may not know, um, Ron Miller had a heart attack this week, doing well, doing very well. Um, he had a, a stint placed in, and as soon as he did, there was no pain and um, expecting to be released from the hospital today. So, but we want to continue to pray for Ron. Nick is down, has an appointment in Boston tomorrow. And sweet Donna, who sits in front here and gives me a hard time during church, um, messaged me early this morning. She had tremendous back pain throughout the night. So she's home resting this morning, probably watching with us. So I want to pray for those things and ask the Lord to, to speak this morning, to bless our service. So let's pray with, together. Father, Lord, you, uh, you listen to our prayers, and that's amazing. Lord, it's such a big deal. You tell us that when two or three gather, you are here. We want to acknowledge your presence. And, and Lord, our, our hearts are, are heavy and uh, concerned and um, rejoicing at the same time. Lord, for the healing that you've done in our brother Ron and the, uh, just the uh, new life that you've given him over the last few months, Lord, physically, spiritually, um, and otherwise. And we ask that you would heal what needs to be healed, Lord, that you'd strengthen him. We're rejoicing that uh, he's feeling better, and, and uh, we do ask that he'd, you'd continue to heal and that he'd be released today. And Lord, for Nick and Jody, who has been seeking answers for months, we pray that tomorrow would be that day, Lord, that they would uh, receive good news and encouragement as they uh, continue to pursue this mystery. We thank you, Lord, for the reliance that that has caused, Lord, not just them upon you, but this church going before you, Lord, seeking answers. We ask for your blessing on them. And for our sweet sister Donna, Lord, we just ask that your presence would be with her this morning, that she would heal her back and uh, restore her to health so she can join us in fellowship soon. And Father, as we dive into your word this morning, um, Lord, keep it simple so we can understand it. Speak to our hearts through it, we pray, and uh, help us get some things that we can use this very day. Change us as a result of it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 is kind of a, a famous section in the scriptures. Um, some might say, some might say for boring reasons. We wouldn't say that, of course, but I, I, it, we've got a couple of different sermons from Paul in here, and, and they're used oftentimes for analysis. People People say, well, Paul did really good in this one, and he kind of blew it in this one, and they, they tend to measure that by the response that's received. And, and we're just coming off a really exciting section in Acts where they're in prison, and an earthquake comes, and the doors open, and their chains are set free. And then, remember, they stay. And, and this was following. They were up at midnight singing and rejoicing and praising. And then the jailer was about to take his own life, in fear that everyone had escaped, and Paul assured them that they were all there. They set aside their own liberty for the sake of the salvation of one. And then we see that the jailer and his family were saved and um, became baptized. And, and I don't know where along the second missionary journey I would have just tapped out. You know, things are really, really hard, God, and I did my thing, and I'm going to stay here and, and grow with this church. But they faithfully continue on in the ministry. And that's where we pick up in chapter 17 this morning, verse 1. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphilopus and Apollyanna, um, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas, the master of understatement. Throughout this, we see not a few or, 
or all of that. And, and it means there's a huge response. So interesting to me, this pattern that we see in Paul, always going to the largest cities in the areas, figuring if they go and, and they do their missionary plant there, that then those people, that church can go out and, and hit the smaller areas. We've seen um, missionary ministries kind of take a different swing uh, in the last century, really, in our country, going out into the bush areas and the smaller areas, and, and in some ways kind of abandoning this, this model that Paul set up of going into the larger cities, build up, strengthen that church, and let them spread the good news. But one of the things that we always do see with Paul is that when he goes into a particular area, if he goes into a synagogue, if there happens to be a synagogue there, he starts with what they know. You know, they, they are believers in, in this half of the Bible. You know, the Old Testament, the, the law and the prophets is taught. And they believe it and they embrace it. So that's always where he starts. So explaining, verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again. This was after spending three weeks with them. So it wasn't just come in and steamroll them and, and give them this message and you're going to go to hell except Jesus instead. But he, he reasoned with them. The, the word actually speaks of dialogue. He talked to them. He listened to them. He exchanged thoughts on the scriptures, dialogued with them, answered questions and uh, asked questions and gave, answered, gave answers. But there was this dialogue that occurred. And um, where it says that he explained the scriptures, the, the, the word actually means opening. He opened up the scriptures. So just... How many of you guys have a favorite scripture? Okay, I'm not going to ask you what it is. Anybody else have a favorite scripture? <laughs> you pretty much know what it is, or there's some that you like. Well, these guys were no different than that. The, the Old Testament Jews in the synagogue, they had passages that were their favorites. And, and oftentimes those were the ones that spoke of the Messiah as a, a coming and reigning king, a conquering king, a savior. And then other passages like Isaiah 53 or um, Psalm 22 that talked about a suffering savior, savior, maybe weren't their favorites, maybe weren't the ones that they would do an in-depth study on. So Paul took them, took their very own scriptures, you know, started with where they were at, dialogued with them over weeks about the scriptures, and then pointed out these other scriptures that explain this Messiah that they're waiting for, why the Messiah must suffer, why that had to happen. And he did it with simplicity. He did it with clarity, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer, that he had to rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So all these scriptures that speak of a suffering Messiah not a, not a reigning king. This is Jesus that I'm talking to you about. So verse 4 says, And then some of them were persuaded. doesn't say all of them. If you've ever shared the gospel, you've probably experienced the same thing, that not everyone that you've spoken to has had a radical change of heart, wanted to make a decision, and, and, and come to Christ right then. But some did. Some of them were persuaded, a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and, and not a few of the leading women. So these were Jews that would be gathered in the synagogue. And then there were Greeks that would gather, or Gentiles that were gathered, that were very, very interested in God. And, and they would come and partake, and, and hear the teachings, and try to find out about this, this God of the Jews. And a multitude of them got saved, and then many, many women came, and they got saved. Verse 5 says, but the Jews who were not persuaded, those that didn't believe, they became envious or jealous, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So Jason was a believer and probably in his home where they gathered, um, certainly where these guys were at the, at the time. So they drag him out. Verse 6 says, But when they did not find them, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. 
Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So when they preached Jesus as a king, they received that. Remember, this was a Roman territory, as somebody that was a threat to the authority. Millions of Christians were killed in the first few centuries because they refused to say that Caesar is king. So this is kind of the accusation that they're, that they're painting, that Jesus is a rival to, to Caesar rather than a personal king, a personal savior. So they drag Jason in, and I love the accusation in verse 6. And I wonder how many of us could have that accusation made against us, and how many could be found guilty. But look at what it says. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. It's quite a testimony, isn't it? I mean, we all want to have an impact. And, and, and we all want to make a difference. And when we evaluate our life it, and ask those questions of, what am I doing that matters? Or what am I doing ministry-wise that matters? And what fruit has come out of my life? Wouldn't it be amazing to have it be said, this guy's life or this gal's life turned the world upside down, turned their family upside down or their community upside down. Now, we, we read that, and the accusation there is that they've messed everything up, and nothing will ever be the same. It's all changed like it's a bad thing. You know, but when your perspective is upside down, when you, oh, man, I'd, I'd love to do some physical demonstrations. Can I get you all to stand on your heads for a minute? <laughs> no. Stoic Mainers sitting in your seats. Thank you for standing for worship, at least. If you all would stand on your heads this morning, and I asked you how things looked, everything would look upside down, right? Things wouldn't look right. The, the floor would be the ceiling. The, the ceiling would be the floor. And when we are governed by our flesh and being ruled by our own thoughts, that's take God's original design of the Garden of Eden and sin, turn that upside down. And that's the world that we live in now. So from the perspective of these men living in the flesh, they see these guys that are preaching Jesus, they've turned the world upside down, which, which means they've made it right again. You know? So that's the accusation. And Jason, he's harbored them. He's had them in his home. And these are all acting contrary to the degrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they had heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. They, they took like bail money, security, that there wouldn't be any more riots. So Jason, you got to pay this. There won't be any riots. I love that too about the ministry of Paul. Everywhere he goes, there's riots. You know, I heard one old English speaking, or English speaking pastor, like myself, one old pastor from England so he was comparing himself to Paul, and he said, everywhere that Paul goes, there's riots, and, and the world is turned upside down. Everywhere I go, they serve me tea, you know? And, it, and if we're not having an impact on the world around us, guys, there's, there's something wrong, you know? Um, the other thing, though, that I want to point out closer to the end of this chapter, and I won't get into all the analysis of, of Paul's sermons, but I just want to remind you here and then at the end, that some believed. He shared the best news that ever existed in the history of mankind, and, and he turned the world around for some, and then others didn't believe. And then others were jealous, and others came after them to persecute them. The, the success of a message is not based on the outcome. And, and I just let that sink in. I want you to hear that today. You know, when you are faithful and you share the word of God, the results, be free from the results. That's not up to you. Because I don't save people and you don't save people. Jesus saves people. So the results are not just his responsibility, but his problem. You know, I think we get so burdened when we see family and friends, and maybe you guys are just coming off of this. Maybe you shared, maybe you, maybe you and we'll see this in, the, in his message on Mars Hill, where I think it was like, scripted, so, so perfectly laid out, reasoned argument, and there's not much of a response. And maybe you did that when you got together with family, and, and you were going to 
convinced them that Jesus was the only way. And it was just like, okay, pass the mashed potatoes, you know. The response is, is his responsibility. It's not a measure of the message. So they let them go. Verse 10 says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So they, they pay this money. Things are getting heated. Things are getting dangerous. Paul, you need to go. So nightfall comes, and, and they send them to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Again, normal practice for them. Verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. So we want to measure that. Why are these people considered more fair-minded? In that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks. There we go again. Prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. So let's back up a little bit and examine these guys. They're more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word in readiness. They, they received it, but it doesn't mean... I, I love that we have the very... The, the second half of this verse, it doesn't just mean that they received it blindly. Everything that, that was taught, spoiler alert, but you guys know that everybody that stands up front or everybody that's on television or everybody that opens up a Bible and reads scripture verses is not necessarily sharing the truth. You guys know that, right? So they received it with readiness. They were anxious to hear. They opened up the scriptures and they reasoned. And, and again, this isn't debated, argued, they gave them good reasons to believe. You know, gave them factual information, gave them the scriptures, discussed it with them, had dialogue with them, and gave them good reasons to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And then they come to the Bereans, and they received it with all readiness, but then they searched the scriptures daily to find out if these things were so. So it, it, wasn't, it doesn't say that they received the scriptures readily because Paul was an awesome speaker. Or, or he was very charismatic in his delivery. Or worship was awesome and it set the scene. And then he got up there and delivered this amazing prepackaged sermon. But he was sharing the word of God. And it was the word of God that they received. And then they examined. Okay, this is what Paul said. And now let me search this out and see if this is what the scriptures say it says. And notice that it wasn't, and, and maybe you've been guilty of this. I have. Or you hear a speaker, and maybe you'll do this, you'll, you'll do some assessment, or you hear somebody online that sounds really good, and you start listening to their podcasts, and you examine their scriptures, and then in, in a message or two, you determine they're right on the money. And then you just receive and accept everything else that they say. And, and that's not what these guys did. It says that they examined daily. You know, a, a passage came out, or, or Paul preached a message, and they dug into the word to see if it was so. And they received that. And then the next day, he preached again. And they dug into the word to see that it was so. You know, this, this is a good exercise for us. This church in Thessalonica, if you read his two letters to that church, it, it ties Acts and First and Second Thessalonians together. That's a good project for you guys to do. Actually, your bulletins say today is November 24th. I won't tell you whose fault that is, but you can guess. Jody's not here. So, meaning me, not Jody. Um, and I changed it to that. That's the sad thing. I didn't just leave it. But today's December 1st. You know, one of the things that we can do too, I, this is like the only good thing I've seen on social media in the last six months probably, but there was a challenge on there to start December 1st reading the book of Luke. 24 chapters in the book of Luke. So if we all do that, start today reading Luke chapter 1, when we come to our Christmas Eve service, we will have read all about Jesus, be prepared to celebrate together that day. We can do the same. First, Second Thessalonians, read about this church, tie the scriptures together. That's what these Bereans were doing. Every day they would examine. Therefore, because of that, because they reasoned in the scriptures and then studied to see if they were so, they believed. Again, it wasn't the dynamic ministry team or it wasn't Paul's charismatic speaking. It was they received the word of God and they examined the word of God. And because of that, they believed. 
Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith, which is what they had when they believed, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So let me throw that out there too, where we're in the Thanksgiving holiday season. This is a time of year that is so awesome for so many of us. And we gather together with, with family and friends and we celebrate. And it's also the hardest time of year for a lot of people with, with short days and seasonal depressive disorder and wounds and past losses and stuff. It's a really, really, really hard time of year. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So hearing the word of God and being in the word of God can, can give you faith like we see here, but it can strengthen your faith. It can renew your faith. It can change lives, change hearts, renew minds. Those things that maybe have plagued you for years can be renewed and refreshed by the word of God. So I encourage you guys in this season in particular to, to be a Berean. And, and even the things that are said from up, especially the things that are said from up here. Examine the scriptures, guys, that they're not opinion. You guys know, if you've known me more than a day, I don't have much to offer other than the word of God. So examine those things, study those things. This is what they did. Therefore, many of them believed and, not, and also not a few of the Greeks, um, prominent men and women as well. Remember, they're in this area of Athens, which is like the intellectual center of the world. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul in Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. So these guys that hated them there followed them here and went after and pursued them. Verse 14 says, then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. Paul, you got to go. Silas and Timothy, you stay, build these guys up because tough times are coming. Verse 15 says, So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So as, you, as soon as you can join me, join me. And then he goes to this area that you've got two different groups of people here. Um, one are the intellects and and want to study and be enlightened and all of that. And then others are, um, want to live at peace. And, and a very simple life is how they define peace. Not being involved in a lot of things, just very simply. So we see this pattern everywhere that Paul goes. He goes to the synagogue. He begins reasoning with them, giving them good reasons to believe, starting with the foundation of what they know. And then here we go to a, an area where there's unbelievers. So he starts from a different framework, starts from kind of where they are. So verse 16 says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, so Paul takes off to Athens, leaves those guys there, come, come join me, and he waits for them, but then he can't wait any longer, right? His spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Have you ever been there? You, 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 you see a need. Or, or you, maybe you go to a different city and, and you just see desperation and you see sin or you see a tremendous need or you visit another family and they don't have the hope of the resurrection or, or any of that and, and you just can't not tell them the truth. This is what Paul's going on. He, he was provoked. He... he uh, was overcome. He saw the city was uh, uh, given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Trying not to go off on a big tangent here. But I'm gonna, a little bit. Paul sees what's going on in this city and, he, and he's provoked by it and, and he can't help but do something. And I want you to look and see what he did. Okay, and listen, there's all kinds of different things that we can do. Um, he waited for them in Athens. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was going over with idols. 
He didn't get a petition going against it. He didn't rally a political campaign. Um, he didn't legislate against what was going on. He reasoned when the, in the synagogue. He went to the church and he reasoned with the people there from the scriptures. With the Jews and the Gentile worshipers. And then he went out into the marketplace every single day and he talked to people about it. He dialogued with them about it. He didn't legislate against him. He didn't do all these other things. But he shared the truth of the word of God. That was Paul's response to being overwhelmed with what was going on in a city. Idol worship. That's, that's where we are as a nation. You could name all kinds of different idols. There's over 3,000 in this community that they were in. But he talked about it inside the church. He talked about it outside of the church. He went to the market every single day. You guys remember, this isn't another tangent. This is an extended tangent. Second Kings. I could summarize this, but I'll just, I'll just read it. 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 38. It says, Elijah returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and, said, and he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophet. So there's a, a famine going on. These are young men, disciples of uh, uh, Elijah, and, and they're starving. So they gather food. They throw it in a pot. Right? So one went out into the field to gather herbs, and he found a wild vine, and he gathered it from a lap full of wild gourds, and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened, as they were eating the stew, that they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in the pot. I love this language. And they couldn't eat it. It was poisoned. You know, and, and I... I Think of this when I think of Paul going into this community and seeing all of this idol worship. And he has the truth. He has the good food, you know, to give them. He has the truth. And he sees this poison going on. And rather than throw it all away, rather than throw this pot all away, it says, um, verse 41 says, So he said, then bring me some flour. Bring me some of the good stuff. And he put the good stuff in the pot. And said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. You know, guys, that, that is the truth of the gospel in our sinful, broken world. We don't just cast it aside and discard it and not interact and not dialogue and separate ourselves and guard up the walls around this church. We go out there daily and we share the truth and we inject the good. And it displaces the bad. You know, it, it, it has an effect. The word of God will not Return void, we're told. So he reasoned in the synagogue. This was his response to, to the idol worship and everything that he saw going on. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. And then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? What is he getting at? What is he talking about? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, um, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. You ever got that response? I don't get it. I had a conversation this week with a guy that was talking to him about the Lord, and he was telling me, I found this so interesting. I caught myself on a little tangent here, but he told me he didn't believe in the devil. And, and of all things to not believe in, in this world, I mean, I totally get, I don't believe in God, and how can a good God let bad things happen? But to not believe that there is evil. And this is what's going on here. These people are like, this is foreign to me, what you're talking about. May we know what this new doctrine is of what you speak. So they're asking, please, they want to be enlightened. That's what this group of people were all about, learning new things. They would come and gather. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. So they're asking. Verse 21, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there were spent 
their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And that too is, is our, our world, trying to find new enlightenment and new things. You guys have heard the, the saying, um, nothing new is true. How's that go? If it's true, it's not new. If it's new, it's not true. They were, they were constantly seeking new things here. Um, and nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Verse 22, Paul's response, and he stood in the midst of the Aeropegasus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So again, he's not in the synagogue. He's not starting from the Old Testament scriptures, but he's walking into a culture that has over 3,000 different idols. And, and the government sees these guys, and they worship this other god, and the government could care less. Like, what's, what's one more source of worship? But so Paul stands in the center, and then he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that you guys are very religious. You know, hey, that's, that's good, he's saying. We know that religion can be good or religion can be bad. Religion can drive you from a relationship with God. But he says, I, I perceive you guys are very religious, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim you. So they had this idol that was entitled the unknown God because with 3,000, who knows? There could be 3,001, right? And they didn't want to miss the one true God. There's a story behind that about sacrifices that were made and they would set up an idol where the, all this happened. But he's saying, let me start with the foundation of where you're at. And, and that only comes through dialogue. That only comes from sitting and listening. I mean, we all go in with an agenda Right, we're going to dialogue, and then I'm going to hammer you with the truth, and I'm going to persuade you. I'm going to turn your world upside down, and you're going to believe. But in order to start from a foundation of where they're at, there has to be some dialogue, which includes listening. So, so Paul observes, and he dialogues every day in the marketplace, and then he says, hey, you know what? I see where you guys are at, and, and you are very religious compared to all these other places that I've been. You, you, you worship dawn to dusk. You know, all these different idols. So I noticed this one that was entitled this unknown God. And that's what I want to talk to you about. This one that you worship without knowing him. That's the one I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. He's different from all these other ones that you worship. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So now he's building on that foundation. So this one that you, that you don't know who you worship, he's the creator. And then he takes it a step further than that. Not only did he create all that he can see, that you can see, but he created you, all that have life. And that changes perspective, doesn't it? It's not just a God that may have some power or may be able to do stuff or, or even created the earth, but he gave you breath and he created you. So now Paul is personalizing this. And, and as a result of God being creator and God being the one that, that created you personally, what responsibility does that give you? Verse 26, And he had made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord, verse 27, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our beings. As for some of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance of God, overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere, repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So this is, this is one of the sermons that's criticized, because the response was much like when I just read this thing to you guys. It's like pretty close to the end of the chapter, okay? We're going to get out. Is he going to do a song at the end? When you lay this out and break this out in an outline, this is like such a perfectly well-reasoned sermon, particularly to this group of people. 
And everywhere else, and I don't know if Paul changed the craft of his sermon because he was speaking to this group of people. Everywhere else we, we see he can't preach the word of God without speaking of the resurrection. And, and he goes through this whole thing, this, this dialogue, and people criticize, well, you should have got to this part first, but let's just play it out here. Verse 32, and when they had heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. He gives out this incredible laid out argument. Not just God is creator, but he gave you breath. And because of that, you ought to turn to him. You ought to repent. But when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they mocked him. While others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Interesting, Paul. Never heard that before, but come back next week. We'll hear a little more kind of thing. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysus and Aeropegite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Sometimes that can be our response. We get all excited. And I, I mentioned Thanksgiving. But I know holidays are a time when we, we know we're going to see people that we, we don't ordinarily get to see. And we know they need, need the truth. And maybe we're waiting for that opportunity. And, and most of my life, I would wait for that opportunity and I would pray. And when I got there, I'd chicken out. You know, it just didn't seem right. And, and maybe you've taken that next step and you've been obedient. Where's Susan? Is she in here? So you can end us with a song. I don't know what song it's going to be, so I can't give you words. But we have opportunity to share and it falls like a marshmallow on sweet potatoes, you know? And we feel burdened by that. And we feel defeated by that. And, and what I want to share, I think the reason why this is in here is not so we can analyze this sermon, but so we can look at, I, don't, I won't call it failure, because some believed, but this big response that Paul wanted didn't happen. And I'll tell you, doing this, when, when we first started the church, I would get comments when people would listen online or, or they'd watch and they couldn't see if there was responses when we gave an invitation. And they would measure, and honestly, I think every pastor does, you work up for an opportunity for somebody to respond. And it's like, do I give an invitation or not? And, and what if nobody responds? And, and be freed from that weight, friend. The response is not ours. Jesus saves people, not us. So the, the results are up to God. And with that, we should do what Paul does, give people good reasons to believe, to place their faith and trust in him. But we shouldn't try to talk people into believing in God or talk people into the kingdom of God because the danger of that, if I can talk you into it, somebody else can talk you out of it, especially when things get hard. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Give them, give them the word. So he's not just creator, but he's your creator. What do we do with that? How does that affect the way that we live? And then just I'll end with this, and Susan's going to close us out in a song. Verse 30. The response that Paul asked for in that. God is the creator of all things, and God has given you life. So he says, these times of ignorance, these times of overlooking things are over. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. And for them, he's saying, you're worshiping 3,000 different gods. Change your mind about that. Change your mind about the Messiah. Realize that it's Jesus. That's what repent means, right? It's change direction. Change your mind. So he, he, the challenge to them is repent. But I think the challenge stays the same to us. You know, when we have this new building, we're actually going to pump the sound in. So <laughs> for those of you that are looking forward to that going away, it's not happening. It brings joy. So like God created you, God gave you breath, you're still here. Those of you that maybe had a heart attack this week, you're still here. So how do we respond to that? You know, one of the things is re repent. Like are, are there things in our life, it, laziness, bitterness, unforgiveness. You know, we just had a time of thankfulness and I'm not trying to bum that out, but part of that, God gave us life. We have life today. God's, God's got a purpose for us tomorrow. 
So what do we need to clean up? I'm going to pray, and then Susan's going to close us out in a song. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for the joy that we hear in that other room. Bless those teachers, Lord. Bless those kids, Lord, that they fall deeper and deeper in love with you. And Lord, thank you for these reminders in your word that our job is to be obedient and to share the good news and the truth that's in your word. And faith comes by hearing that, Lord, but that's not something we can manufacture and that's not something we can talk people into. So Lord, we do pray that you would open hearts and that you would cause a response to your word, a change of mind about Jesus, that you would become Lord and Savior. Give us opportunity this week, Lord, we pray. And give us the freedom of knowing the results belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen.